All right, thank you. Yeah, so the White House, I was so excited about the White House and um, I pitched the whole idea of leak free and come to find out they didn't care about leak free at all. Um, they cared about, go ahead to the next slide, Dan. They cared about this whole idea of the um, carbon footprint of pipelines because the largest users, Dan, of electricity in most cities are the utilities that are pumping water from A to B. You know, I kind of look at this slide after all these people are talking, these smart people are talking about desalination and icebergs and rainwater harvesting. And I wonder, well, who's the smart guy in the room? Well, it's the waiter. This guy says, eliminate the leaks. You know, at this time, five years ago, San Diego County Water Authority had just completed their uh, mil uh, billion dollar desalination plant. Billion dollars. They could have taken just 300 million of that, converted all their pipes, and gone from an 11% leakage rate to zero and saved $700 million and not needed that extra water. So it's these kind of questions that we at the Alliance are calling into question and kind of wondering. So we're kind of taking a look now at, at some of our numbers and what, what do these numbers mean and, and why do we care about them? Well, the product's been around for since 1959. It's not a new product. It's a product that's been around forever. Uh, and ASCE tells us the VIG between what we should be spending and our spending is $1.4 trillion. So this, this big uh, infrastructure initiative comes by with the current administration, and it's fantastic, but you know, it's still not enough. The water market is only going to see $55 billion uh, when we need $1.4 trillion. So you see it's a drop in the bucket. And $2.1 trillion is what AWWA says is, the, is how many gallons we lose every single year in our water utilities. Polyethylene doesn't lose any. Uh, 14 um, is an important number because that's the average water loss rate for the utilities according to AWWA in the United States, 14% of the water. I personally think it's higher. Um, and then 18,000 is the number of miles that we put in the ground of polyethylene in municipal water systems in 2021. So very, very exciting year for us as far as the adoption of the product. So now we're taking a look at, you know, why use polyethylene? A lot of great reasons. The seismic performance of the product is what I want to talk about here for the next couple of minutes. And Dan, you know, we have probably 40 people that have heard this talk before on the call today. I couldn't believe how many people have signed up. But, you know, repetition is a really good thing because then you start to believe it or question it so that some of these issues are top of mind. Why seismic? Because we believe that if polyethylene can hand the handle the most significant ground movement there is, it can handle subtle freeze-thaw movements, soil constriction because of drought, et cetera. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the Water Research Foundation study. Uh, Edinger and Davis uh, did this study uh, for the Water Research Foundation, um, and this was published years ago now. And they looked at the three biggest earthquakes in the world. The first one's Concepcion, Chile, which is really an exciting look at a private water company, so think American Water um, in the United States, deciding to use polyethylene after a 8.0 earthquake in 2001. Well, that's what SPO did. So they had nine years of polyethylene use when this big one came in 2010. <coughs> Excuse me. So this big earthquake comes, it had nine years of their capital plan of only using polyethylene, and all the legacy pipe systems of other materials continued to fail. I've got two earthquakes now. 2001 and 2010, and then 2010, that nine years of their capital plan, none of those polyethylene pipes failed. So here we have no pipeline failures, really an exciting story for Concepcion, Chile. Now we move on to Christchurch. So you may remember this one where they had four 6.0s in 15 months, crazy, 1700 line breaks, 160 kilometers of polyethylene, none of that failed in any of those earthquakes. And the mayor goes to the public works director and says, dude, what's up? And he goes, well, we're having a heck of a time with water and wastewater, but thank goodness we're okay with our gas lines. Now, this is a direct message to everybody on this call today. Did you hear what I said? No failures in the gas lines. All the gas lines are polyethylene. No failures in the gas lines. How cool is that? So the, the mayor, you know, I was an elected official for nine years. What do I know about... Um, pipe, right, as an elected official, don't know anything about pipe. So the public works director is like, dude, you know anything about pipe? So he did research. 
And he met this guy, Tom O'Rourke online from Cornell University, who said, yeah, polyethylene is part of the inherent nature of the product. It, it moves with the ground, it bends, it flexes, it doesn't fail. So O'Rourke had just finished that study. Mayor's like, hey, dude, do a test section. So he did a test section at Christchurch and it didn't fail. Now Christchurch uses polyethylene. And then of course, the big one in the Tohoku prefecture in Japan, this is the one that we all talked about, an 8.0, or excuse me, a 9.0, it uh, lasted up to five minutes. And you know what? We had no polyethylene failures here as well. So, wow, most of the failures in legacy systems occurred as a result of the ground movement, not because of the tidal waves. Um, so what we have is thousands of failures, thousands of deaths, billions in damage, um, and no polyethylene failures. And this is true across all three of those earthquake events. But you know what? Nobody really cares because it's outside the United States, right? In the United States, we're not caring so much about it. So after this 6.0 earthquake in Napa from five years ago, I went out there and I interviewed the engineer and she told me we had 132 water main breaks. I'm like, wow, that's bad. She said, oh yeah, we're gonna get them fixed. We got 10 cities helping us and we're gonna get them fixed. And I said, well, how'd your polyethylene lines do? And she said, sir, we don't use polyethylene. Richard. Hey, how you doing, Peter? Hello, Good. everybody. Welcome. Um, I, hey, thank you. Um, I'm not sure that my, my picture is showing up on the screen, but um, anyways, I just want to add other comments that we commonly don't think about when we see these catastrophic events occur as we talk about fires. You know, and the, you know, we typically have fires when buildings collapse and things like that. So uh, if you don't have these gas lines failing, then you don't accelerate that fire um, uh, event. So it saves lives. Uh, so it's almost like it's a built-in safety margin that you don't even account for. Um, will it survive every single situation? Um, so far, so good. Um, but, you know, there could be a building that collapses or an iron piece that cuts through it. Uh, sure, but that seems to have not happened yet. So it's it's quite impressive. And I just wanted to add a little color onto that aspect because we don't think about those aspects of still saving lives. Well, the exciting thing about all that data that I cited, Richard, is that it didn't even fail in the, in the case of a building falling on it. Now, most of our polyethylene is under the ground. Um, but then, you know, the story Dan just brought on Napa San, you know, here I interviewed the engineer for the city of Napa, but we also had Napa Sanitation and they had the same earthquake, I think, at the same time. And they had, they've been having poly in, the line, in their ground for 30 years with no failures. And then two years ago, I went out to Trona uh, after they had a 7.1. And the same thing occurred here, guys. Um, hundreds of miles with PG&E and Searle, no polyethylene failures, yet the city was without water for two weeks because they, they used legacy systems. Hey, Dan, let's take a break from earthquakes for a second. Can you pull up our first poll? Um, you know, we've got over 350 or so people on this call, I'd like to ask them, you know, why are they on this call today? Can you do that, Dan? Okay, so if everybody could answer, the, answer this, why are you on this call today? We're gonna leave it up for about 20 seconds. Um, and if I didn't get a good answer there for you, just don't answer. But we're very interested in why, because usually, you know, we have 100 to 150 to 250 people um, sign up for this, but here we have a whole lot more. All right, Dan, let's keep it um, open for about five more seconds here, uh, 10 more seconds, and let me talk about Tom O'Rourke. So Tom O'Rourke, the guy that the head of the uh, city in um, Christchurch got a hold of this guy, and Tom was in the midst of doing a study, or had just published his study um, of, look at that trench box, and he was doing a simulated fault um, Click on that animation, Dan, see if it shows up. And so he put a 35 foot long stick of polyethylene in there and to see what would happen. Those are humans in the upper right hand corner and there's that trench box moving. So there's several tons of earth in this entrenched stick of polyethylene pipe. All right, Dan, let's go to the results of the poll. Can you bring them up? Can you see them, Peter? Yeah, my boss told me to, only 7%. <laughs> 20% of the people on the call are here for the CEUs and 47% are saying, hey, I want to learn a little bit more. That is awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, for responding there. Richard, tell us what's going on on the inside of that pipe at Tom O'Rourke's facility. 
Yeah, um, really what you're seeing is the inside of the pipe. And of course, there's sensors all across that, uh, that whole pipe on the inside as well to look at the, the strain that's being applied to the, the pipe itself. But, you know, really what you're seeing are, are here is just the ductility of polyethylene. And, and really when they, finished, when they finished moving this box across, of course, the box stopped and then the pipe had this S shape in it. But when they started to de-earth that pipe in that box, the pipe actually started to come back to a straight line and relieve those stresses again. So not that that would happen in an underground situation um, if you had a dip or something occurred but uh, like that, but it means that you're containing that water and you still have the ability uh, to hold pressure and water supply. Thanks, Richard. Go ahead, Danny. All right, so <clears throat> go ahead and reel it. Yeah, that's a six inch, um, 500 foot roll on the right there of polyethylene uh, in that reel. And that guy's five and a half feet tall. Now here we have a 500 foot reel. And Richard, what is that? Like zero degrees? You took that video. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's. Well, we got minus, it anchored with the truck now. Oh, sorry, it was minus 35 degrees Celsius. So getting close to minus 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and that's a, a five inch DR7. Uh, so a very thick walled pipe. So you think that it would hold its memory. But again, it's still very ductile at that temperature, at those cooler temperatures. We laid that uh, lined out, we fused the ends together and we connected it to the well services and away they went. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. I was just looking at, uh, Dan, the questions. We've only had two questions so far. I'm sure there are more out there. So please take a moment and send us your questions and give Doug and Dan something to do. All right. <clears throat> I'm often asked, you know, oh, I already have 12 types of pipe in the ground. Why do I want another one? Well, you take a look at this, mate, this slide of the various pipes over time and the various methods that humans have come up with to move sewage and bring water from A to B. And, you know, we've got clay and steel and open trench and wood and cast iron and, and uh, asbestos. You know, for the younger folks out there, AC pipe, commonly referred as transite or asbestos cement pipe, is the pipe that failed in Bellevue, Washington over the weekend. Uh, that was an eight inch that caused that landslide. Um, and the engineer was quoted as having said, yeah, well, um, you know, pipe's supposed to last 120 years. Well, I've got news for you. The average age of metal pipe coming out of the ground today, according to AWWA, is 49 years. Uh, AC pipe was built to last 50 years. And we used it uh, back in the early 1940s during the war years because we didn't have any metal to use. Metal was all going toward the war effort. We quit making it in the early 1970s. So it had a 30 year one run. And guess what? We're at 50 years right now. That's why so much of it is starting to fail. Dan, could you go back? Um, so that's the story on AC pipe. And it's a tremendous market for polyethylene because we can pipe burst that product. There are 500,000 miles of it in use in the United States, according to Black and Veatch. That's a lot of AC pipe we got to get rid of. Uh, ductile iron and PVC and uh, HDPE were all commercialized in the 1960s. Uh, polyethylene, you wonder, why don't we own the water market? We own every other market we're in, geothermal, landfill, natural gas, mining. Um, well, because we went after all those other markets and didn't pay attention to water. That's why PVC is pretty much only used as conduit and water, and they don't use ductile iron in significant markets where corrosion is an issue. It's pretty much a water market thing. These folks have a vested interest in not seeing us succeed. And I get that, I do the same thing that they're doing. Um, so we started paying attention to the water market about 25 years ago or so. Go ahead, Dan. But it's very interesting when you put it in context. So we could say, hey, business as usual, folks, you wanna keep doing things the way you've always done, or do you wanna consider trenchless? 47% of the people on this call have learned a little bit. Dan, click on that image on the right. Let's get it to go. So this is a pneumatic pipe burst going through some of that AC pipe. Look at how easy it goes through that. Now that's a that's an excavation that we did to tie into a, a lateral uh, that was out in uh, California uh, mid-year last year. So it's really an exciting opportunity. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, and and just uh, I just want to touch base with this. 
You know, we talk about what's coming up now in the question uh, area, uh, Peter, is thrust blocking. And, you know, so when you look at a total polyethylene system, no thrust blocks necessary. You don't have to do that. You're not thinking again, just like um, uh, Peter saying, business as usual, question mark. Well, the thing is, it's you don't have to use thrust blocks. So just think of the cost savings, just not putting in with a 100% polyethylene system. It's all self-restrained because it has the ability to absorb those stresses that are applied through um, uh, surge effects, et cetera. So it's really, really important. But we do have we do have thrust blocking requirements when it comes to connecting to legacy type products. And those are all found in the PPI manual and the AWWA manual as well. Yeah, we've got some videos that tell that story. Hey, Dan, could you pay attention to chat? Do you have the pigging video? I saw a question come in on that. Um, I don't have it on this computer, but I'd love I to answer. Yeah, well, can you bring that up and show us uh, that pigging video? So, uh, Doug, what was the question on pigging? Sorry, Peter, as I'm responding to an answer. So the, the question was, is pigging allowed for PE pipe um, and how would you perform it without uh, having dam creating damage to the pipe. Got it. All right, Dan, run the video. <clears throat> this is a pretty common way to pig polyethylene uh, post fusion and post tie in. So here we have a flanged end at 12 o'clock on the pipe. This is super chlorinated water. So we have a double pig. And we noticed some shavings in there. That was from the operator not cleaning out the inside of the pipe during facing operations. So that can be avoided with uh, better technique, uh, but that's an example of pigging. Uh, Dan, we also had a question come in yesterday uh, about jetting polyethylene pipe. Could you respond to that issue? Yeah, do you want me to pull back the video? Uh, sure, if you have it handy. Okay, yeah, I can pull it up. But essentially, they had... I it wasn't my case, it was Scott's, but they had some sort of, I believe a small buildup, but they were trying to figure out, can they go in and jet, uh, jet that system out? And the answer is yes. We don't have this video up yet on our YouTube page. We probably should go ahead and get this up. It's a, an interesting video, but. Uh, yeah, we, which version? Do you have the minute, one minute one, or do you have the four minute one? I have the one minute, there's no captions. So I'll turn, Okay. can you see it now? Yeah, so. Right, I'll turn, turn the this, audio down a little bit. Yeah, turn the audio down and let me narrate. So here was some 12-inch uh, gray polyethylene, which is polyethylene, just doesn't have the black master batch in it. So it has a, a limited outdoor life similar to PVC. And so here we had the city of San Francisco saying, hey, can you jet HDPE? And the answer is, yeah, you can jet it. What we were trying to do here is remove the interior bead. And now we're gonna take it up to 5,000 PSI we're trying to cut the inside of the pipe with that water. And you know what? We could not, even at 5,000 PSI, we were not successful in damaging the pipe. We sent it to a lab. Even the interior bead was still intact. Now, the pipe was intact, but my GoPro wasn't. Um, it got nailed by it. Um, but so anyway, Dan, thanks for showing that. Let's go back to the deck. So those were good questions. Um, keep firing away and Doug, and Dan, don't be afraid to interject. So yeah, let's go with pipe bursting. What, a, what an exciting way to uh, take advantage of an existing runway for a pipe. Let's put in polyethylene. And we are simultaneously breaking up the host pipe and bringing in the new polyethylene right behind it. Next slide, please. So back when I was in college, a limestone formation would be subject to this sort of damage by water. Those were called sinkholes. Now we have a different definition of a sinkhole. When cars fall in a hole caused by a damaged water main, that's what that is. But you know what? That doesn't really happen with polyethylene. We're not making this stuff up. Next slide, please. So final comparison here with uh, the ductile iron product. Um, I was on a call with a ductile iron guy and we were doing a comparison and he said, yeah, you guys in the polyethylene world, you've had to innovate to keep your product relevant. I mean, are you kidding? Um, talk about innovation. We've taken our resin and we've solved the chlorine issue. We solved the issue of point 
damage and running cracks. It no longer happens to polyethylene. Those were first generation polyethylene issues. We're on the fourth generation. We don't have that issue anymore. So what have the ductile iron people done to keep their product relevant? Well, they coat the inside of it with cement. They wrap the outside of it with polyethylene. And then they connect it up to electric mechanisms for anodes and cathodes so that straight currents don't damage it. I mean, how much do you have to do to their pipe where it's not their pipe anymore? So polyethylene wrapped ductile iron is what you're buying today. Bellevue, Washington, well-run system, 125 year cycle time, just had that AC water main break. They love cement lined, polyethylene wrapped ductile iron. Are you kidding me? No wonder it's six times as expensive as polyethylene. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, so that's the product differentiation. I need to put that into a one pager. So what kind of failures do we see with legacy systems that polyethylene is solved for? We see cast iron circular breaks. That's a common way cast iron fails. Ductile iron fails with tuberculation, both inside out and outside in. And then finally, we see, you know, um, over, um, over insertion with PVC and cracking of the bell and spigot with over insertion. All right, next slide. Then we have what we call allowable leakage rates for legacy pipe systems. And with both with ductile iron and PVC, I don't know if you know this engineers, but there's an allowable leakage from day one. Richard, what is polyethylene's allowable leakage rate? Yeah, Can't Peter, it, it's, it's zero. It's zero uh, because we leaks are a problem. Leaks are a problem with um, any kind of pipeline system because if you have water going underneath them or leaking through a bell and spigot, then you're you're talking about erosion of some kind that's going to occur. So it's going to affect the that alignment, especially in in gravity systems, and and you don't want to do that. So we can we can hold it if you're containing that water all the time with no inf uh, infiltration or exfiltration then it's a sound pipeline. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, pretty cool. And then we have, um, you know, one of our challenges is trying to keep you all interested in polyethylene, but at the same time, helping you realize the way you're doing it perhaps isn't the way you should be doing it. And I've been working in Tulsa for 10 years, trying to get them to pay attention to polyethylene. But when the big freeze happened last year, they saw, you know, how many? add those up 80, 100, 150 water main breaks over the course of a weekend. And the temperatures were very cold. And the reason the legacy systems fail is because the ground moves, it gets brittle and the pressure causes a failure or older pipes cause a failure. This is a thing, I call it manage to fail. We manage to failure and we accept it because we have these large staffs of people and we have these contracts with contractors to come in and fix the stuff that we let break. But you say, oh, we didn't let it break. No, but you know it's gonna break because you have a history of breakage. What we see from public utilities that adopt polyethylene in a big way is their breaks go way down and the amount of money they have for capital projects goes way up because they're not spending it on maintenance. This has been true time and time again. All right, that's about it on preaching. Go ahead, Dan, one more slide. So let's listen to this gentleman from Duluth, which is one of those utilities and some lessons learned what that we see from him. What were some issues the city was seeing in its conveyance of water from A to B? Uh, big things are corrosion and leaks. Over time- Dan, can you turn that up? Leaks and water main breaks we had. What were some of the issues the city was seeing in its conveyance of water from A to B? Uh, big things are corrosion and leaks. Over time, a number of leaks and water main breaks we had each year just kept spiraling up and up. And we define a leak as a uh, water coming out of the pipe that we can fix anytime we get to it, where a break is something we call an emergency and fix it right now. But we got as high as about 160 leaks and 160 breaks or a total of 320 holes in the ground up in one year. And we're trending back down finally now. Um, but that's all that's because we've gone out and focused on the worst neighborhoods. We pulled out the cast iron and the ductile iron and stuck in polyethylene and we just don't have the failures anymore. So you used to see a, at most 320 a year. What are you looking at now on an annual basis? Uh, last year we had 127 leaks and breaks combined. Wow, so you've cut it to a third. We cut it to a third, but a lot of, some of that's affected by temperature. I can't take all the credit. 
but you had some breaks. Were they in polyethylene or are they in traditional no. materials? Traditional materials. Yeah, we don't have breaks in polyethylene. Yeah, I love that video. Um, Peter, we're getting a couple questions on thrust blocks. Do you want to go ahead and tackle that, uh, Richard, real quick? Why HDP doesn't need thrust blocks on a, on a monolithic system, but does when tying into, into PVC and other legacies? Uh, abso absolutely. Uh, as I said earlier, um, uh, polyethylene, because really the only reason we have to use thrust blocks on a polyethylene system tied into a legacy balance picket is because when we fire up the line, uh, we'll have Poisson's laws of expansion. Um, so what will happen is the pipeline will expand a little bit and shorten that pipeline. And we don't want the polyethylene pulling the balance picket apart in the first couple of joints or one or two joints. So we have to thrust lock that just to hold that system in place. So that expansion or that expansion of the diameter doesn't shorten uh, and pull that uh, balance picket out. In a, in a um, total polyethylene system, even though you're connected to valves as well, if MJ adapters are used, MJ adapters do not need to be thrust block. Um, they are designed, Harvey Svetlik, I know the designer of that specific um, uh, MJ adapter, and he's designed it in such a way that it will take care of the stresses. And I think he did three times the normal stresses that occur when you fire up a line. And so he calls that joint self-restraint. So you don't have to worry about that. And same with valves. So MG adapters, the way they're designed, you do not have to worry about it. And I talked to him about it uh, probably about six months ago. And I asked him, I said, okay, Harvey, you've had these MG adapters in the system for a couple of years now, uh, you know, or, or more. And I said, Pick a how many fillers you've had? Like three of them. In yeah, each person. And, yeah. And he said, he said none. So absolutely none. So there's no failures there. There's nothing to worry about it. So when you calculate the stresses uh, that, which you can calculate, that are uh, applied to an MJ adapter when you fire up a line with Poisson's loss, um, you'll see that those stresses are very low and the MJ adapters can handle those without any problem. So Richard, you know, that's a good point. That's one of the things, you know, that video we just watched from the guy in Duluth, the engineer. Um, some of the lessons that we learned from him, Richard, were related to connections with other materials, fusion training, right? And the um, capital plan lesson, which was because he's fixed all his mains, he does, he's, now he puts his guys on the capital side instead of maintenance. So he didn't lay anybody off. He just reoriented them to a different part of the utility. So he learned, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, and that and for me, for me, instead of reactive maintenance, now you have proactive maintenance. And uh, I know in university when we were taught about taught about preventative maintenance, uh, you'd want to get to the proactive mode, not the reactive mode, because it's unpredictable, um, and so it can be expensive. Um, and so when we start eliminating these expensive sides, and I know we've had discussions with some some union representatives that you're taking away my overtime, but just move it into different aspects of that union whether it's education so they can they, if they have more education they can pay them more or they can they can just have uh, uh, more opportunities to do things that are more proactive such as looking after the pumps monitoring the pumps you know monitoring the systems that make that work properly um, I think that's way more of a benefit yeah uh, one more thing Richard that I learned from um, the engineer in Duluth was his his focus on training and how he requires every contractor that does a capital project or a repair project in his utility every year to go through training. Give us a little background on that. Yeah, and this is uh, really stems from an ASTM requirement. ASTM is our US and North American base for uh, conducting uh, activities. And so it's standardized. So we do want to standardize it because it's very, very important. And the key there is, is if you continue the training, the training should be done in such a manner that everybody does it exactly the same way. Um, and that's what we're really targeting. Um, no shortcuts, no, I thought it was done this way, or I've been doing this for many years, and, I, and this is the way I'm always going to do it. Just do it the way that it's been set up, because we know and we've proven that this methodology works. And, and I think there was part of the question, too, well, who else besides McElroy can train? All the, all the distributors, such as Zisco, Corn, Maine, Ferguson, Wolseley's, 
All those guys also are now conducting this training as well. And even the PE Alliance will come and help you get started with that as well, because they can give you guidance to how these programs should look. And they're, they're very laid out. And the PPI, the Plastics Pipe Institute, has also laid out these procedures very, very well um, and make it very, very possible to standardize. Well, I appreciate you talking about the Alliance. Um, uh, well, it looks like Dan wants to show a video. Dan, show us a video here. Yeah, Richard was talking about getting from uh, getting away from preventative maintenance and just having a better solution, not always reacting, getting into that pre preventative. And I know you've seen this because it's from Dustin Langston. And this is one of his favorite videos to share. But the point being, it being too late when you start addressing the problem, that's kind of really what I think Richard's driving home is the time to start with this preventative maintenance is now. I don't think all failures are, are this, this massive, but it's also not as rare as it should be. Well, it's pretty typical. I wonder if Dusty's the one that put it to music. <laughs> uh, he's pretty hip. Yeah, I don't know. He just... keeps up with the kids. Yeah, hey, Richard. Not... Richard, tell, tell me about mechanical repair clamps and polyethylene. How, how is it we can use them and do we use them? Yeah, um, yeah. So, I mean, there's what we discovered over the past 20 years is that a lot of the municipalities for water need to address water leaks very quickly. And some of them have a very short time frame within 24 hours. And so we went to these um, clamping guys and said, you know, can you design a, uh, a, a clamp that can give a temporary fix and actually hold the pipe? Well, the nice thing about polyethylene, the more those guys clamp down on that rigid product, and the more brittle it, the more brittle it became, and so uh, it, you're not really helping the matter by tightening it more. But with polyethylene being so ductile, you can literally squeeze down onto it and temporarily fix those leaks very easily, where you don't have to worry about additional cracking or propagation of a crack because you're adding uh, stresses because of the clamp. And so they've designed these clamps, they work very well. Some of them, some people are using them as permanent fixes, but if, if I can recommend anything, if you can go back and shut down the line shortly and put an electrofusion coupling or sleeve in there, which we have procedures for that too, then you're back to a solid monolithic system where you never have to worry about the clamp corroding or doing something uh, long-term. So um, there are methods to do that. And we do have that ability to repair very, very quickly. Yeah, so what in that video that Dan just showed, those were Hymax products, the Grip and the Versa. Um, and what I say is, hey, how do you fix polyethylene today? Just do it the same way you do it. You got a Hymax clamp, uh, repair clamp on the truck, use that. Um, if it's a current one, consider it permanent if it's on polyethylene. But fixing polyethylene is just like fixing anything else. And we find, Richard, that the failures we see in polyethylene are few and far between, but when they do occur, these clamps work great. Yeah, they do. And that's the point. Like we were still mystified a little bit by, well, how, you know, it's, that question comes up every time we have a one-on-one -on -one. and it's a great question. Uh, but typically what you'll end up with is a system that doesn't fail. Yeah, very true. All right, Dan, we've got one other slide that's on the topic of what we've been talking about. Um, Richard, uh, Doug had a question on the thermal effects on above grade polyethylene. So we have a separate webinar just on above grade. Um, but could you give us a quick review of uh, what effect heat has on polyethylene? Yeah, I mean, for piping products, of course, I mean, we can, we can take the first place prize for the largest uh, expansion and contraction differential in temperature. Uh, we can also take the uh, first prize for expansion and contraction in Poisson's laws of expansion and contraction because we are a ductile product. So don't let that scare you. Uh, we understand the thermal effects so well that we know how to control it. And we even, and in this slide that you're seeing now, you can see in, in the in comparable situation to carbon steel to high density, the loads and the stresses that are applied when that expansion and contraction occurs. And you can see they're significantly less in polyethylene. So we can manage that easier. 
Uh, for the above ground questions, yeah, if you want to run a line above ground, um, we do recommend that your, your ambient temperatures are going to change throughout the day. So one inch per 10 degrees per 100 feet of pipe applies to any diameter as long as it's completely unrestrained. So any kind of friction on that pipe will reduce that value. However, this is the worst case scenario. So you can, you can um, button it up. You can use concrete uh, pillars to hold it in place if you wanted to do that. Um, uh, landfills use it quite a bit. They just pin it in with um, uh, typically wood, wood stakes and they're holding it in place or you can completely restrain it. Uh, you can use concrete blocks to, and clamps to completely restrain it if you wanted to. And as soon as you narrow that distance, then of course that, that expansion and contraction differential will become reduced. So uh, in the top slide there on the left-hand side, you can use expansion loops, like a lot of methane gathering in, in, uh, in landfills is being used. Uh, use, a, use an expansion loop. That expansion loop, that little, little U-shaped uh, 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 system in the bottom with the four... 490s in it um, will take care of that, that expansion and contraction and you don't have to worry about it. And here's the beautiful thing about it. Although it moves, it will never fail by fatigue. Uh, and that is a concept that everybody has a hard time with. We do not fail by fatigue. So if we expand it, contract it, expand it, contract it, we do not see failure in polyethylene because it goes back to its normal state. You're not ripping apart the polymer, but if you did exceed that yield, then you've just overpressurized. Uh, hey, the fascinating all... thing about what you just said is most people in the audience, Richard, don't believe you. Um, but PVC <laughs> does fail with fatigue. It's, a, it's already a brittle product at temperature. But once you start adding cycles to it, it will fail. That's why some of the failures are so spectacular because it splits and runs. But ductile doesn't fail that way. It doesn't fail because of fatigue. It, it is indeed the strongest material. Uh, it fails because of the presence of oxygen. Um, so its failures are not spectacular, but they occur more frequently. So it's a crazy, crazy dichotomy that we see in the various materials. But Richard, how do we fail? If we don't fail that way, how do we fail? Well, um, personally, I've been in this business for 38 years designing the pipe products. I've never seen an operate, a normal operation water system or oil system uh, that has failed by fatigue. I've never seen one. Um, I've seen a failure in pressure testing where lines were overpressurized uh, by accident and they did fail ductile, which I think is the greatest failure in the world. Um, but slow crack growth, uh, this is a penetration of a reagent or a chlorine uh, uh, oxidizer. Um, we've eliminated that as well. So we in the past saw these types of failures in Arizona in high temperature applications where uh, the um, service lines were going into the house and they're exposed to very active chlorine. And we did see those slow crack growth failures, but because we've engineered the resin now to eliminate that, that slow crack growth failure. Is so you guys created. actually changed the resin to accommodate real time uses of the product. Absolutely. If you don't, if the municipality doesn't have problem and they can keep their water clean and they can keep it disinfected and they can keep it free flowing and they don't have infiltration of bacteria or any kind of bacterial growth because high density doesn't support any kind of bacterial growth because it's inert. It's inert. There's nothing that can leach out of it because it's inert. Um, and so we want to, we want to just say that, why wouldn't you use that? So we want to solve your problems. So if we solve your problems, then I don't have problems. Well, I see. So that's the technical side. I see in the field, I've seen um, on occasion electrofusion failures, Richard, where the owner wrote a spec <clears throat> that permitted the contractor to have somebody do electrofusion. So we're putting a saddle on the OD of a main or we're putting in an electrofusion coupler to connect two pipe ends where that failed. Yes. So third party, we, we refer that to third party damage, whether a backhoe hits it. Or, a, or an improper installation like you described. But this is where our training is critical. And this is where if we know, we know in the polyethylene industry, if it's done correctly, it will work. There is no question about it. And I will, I will challenge anybody any day of the week uh, to have this, to have this uh, um, uh, competition if you want to have it, because it's, I know it works. It has the fusibility, it has the fusibility uh, all polyethylenes are compatible. So my, my resin, Ineos, everybody's pipe is the same. 
Um, so, and it's very highly regulated to be the same because we don't want these issues to occur. So if All you right. conduct your position, okay. Yeah, go, okay, ahead. go ahead. Um, so, can you, Richard, uh, can you help Doug on questions? We're getting a lot of them now. Sure. And Dan, sure. if you could just stay with me and handle chat and back yep. me up. And we'll let those two guys handle the questions. Thank you for all the questions. This is just fantastic. So I look at polyethylene as a best practice. Uh, we now have the science and it's one of the reasons you're like, why does he talk so much about data? Well, because I'm not going to convince you to use the product unless I bring in third parties that also study this. And we've created a best practice for, for utilities and the 20 some year, 30, 40 year use of utilities in the United States of their use of polyethylene backs up our conjecture. So we believe according to Webster's that it is indeed a procedure that has been shown through research and experience to produce optimal results. And we can back it up with real life um, utilities. Corporately, who's paying attention to polyethylene? Google, Apple, Tesla. And we've got Disney and Ford on the call today. I'm hoping that they're looking at it as well. Um, but these utilities that look at, or these companies that look at best practices are looking to polyethylene. Google, Apple, Tesla, 100% of their below grade um, site work was done with polyethylene. The Wall Street Journal reported three years ago on the De Helve Man Brewery in Bruges, Belgium. Uh, the mayor was mad at the brewery because they had all these bottling trucks going back and forth between the brewery and the bottling plant. What'd they do? They created a beer main, believe it or not. That's a 10 inch polyethylene line. Hit the animation, Dan. Um, that's called a beer main. So we're so excited to see it in industry this way as well. And then three years ago, we had Cape Town, South Africa almost run out of water. What'd they do? They built seven desalination plants. They ran polyethylene, sucked a lot of water out of the ocean. <coughs> Excuse me. Next, then we have the uh, fantastic story of the Thai cave rescue. I just ordered the book uh, that tells the story of this cave rescue, but those are polyethylene sticks that they ran them into the cave to suck water out of that cave. And they didn't use fusion, obviously, in the water, in the wet environment, uh, but they did use like those Poisson electrofusion. Um, Dan, what do you call those couplers that you tighten manually that isn't fusion? Compression? Yeah, compression fittings, thank you. It's been a while since I've given this talk. Um, so they use compression fittings and the army, the, these guys are in the army and you can see in the lower image there on the bottom of that image, the water coming out of one of those polyethylene pipes. Fantastic story, polyethylene saves the day. Not to mention the ingenuity and the hard work of the people. I'm not saying that that wasn't part of it. I'm just saying polyethylene played an important role. Go ahead, Dan. All right. Now what we're looking at is Netflix. Everybody on the call watches Netflix, I think. My favorite story, and I had Bruno Tideman on the podcast. He's the manufacturer of those Tideman boats that Ryan Reynolds used in that show on Netflix, Six Underground. It's just a great action adventure. Um, but Bruno was pretty excited because he got to rent the boats to the guys and, he, and they paid rack rate to borrow um, to use those boats. But those are all made out of polyethylene with the exception of the engine. So great story with Tideman boats. Polyethylene is leak free, uh, provided you do the fusions correctly. Clean it, shave it, heat it, fuse it. Let's take a look at what that looks like, Dan. So on this next slide, we've got a clean it, we shaved it, we heated it, and now we're fusing it. And this whole training regimen that we go through and that we talk about is devoted to creating two pipe ends directly opposite one another, properly shaved, properly heated, and stuck together. That's one of the fantastic things about the resin. It allows repeated um, heatings, infusions, and it doesn't degrade. Go ahead to the next slide. So this is what it looks like from the inside. So it's been cleaned, now we're shaving it. The industry likes to call it facing, but I wonder what the heck does that mean, so I call it shaving. So we're shaving the OD of the end of a pipe. And this pipe is not black, it's got a gray um, interior that's co-extruded. Um, so at the end of this, we're gonna see this, so we've cleaned it, we've shaved it now, we're gonna pull it apart. We're gonna pull those ribbons out of that pipe end. You may recall we saw a ribbon or two, so we saw some shavings in that pigging video. 
This is because the guy didn't clean it out at this point. And then the next slide, Dan, is when uh, it's coming together. No, go one more. You've got too many animations there. Okay, now we go. Here we go. Hit play there. Um, now we've got this green cam core coming together after we've pulled those ribbons out. And here the operator has lined up the stripes. But this training, we don't want you to use polyethylene nice. if you're not willing to commit to the training. So training is a good thing. Um, it's not like the bell and spigot, we teach you in the trench, no. We want you to go through the proper training and talk to our distributors. They can get you trained up. But you can also remove the bead. Folks in California love that bead removal. So think in gravity, 1% greater or less, Let's remove that interior bead. So we stick this RNL bead removal tool in there. We go backwards a full turn, and then we go forwards or clockwise, and then we see the popping cutter come out. And we can then remove remotely that bead from 50 feet away. So you do a fusion, let it cool, stick the thing in there, go through this process, and now you see that uh, interior bead um, has been removed. Great little process that RNLs come up with. They sell a ton of these across the US. So I talked a little bit about electrofusion. It's nothing to be afraid of. But if you've got a contractor on your job site, he says, here's my card. I'm a certified fusion. He'll say fusion, he won't say butt fusion. And that means he's trying to say, I've got credentials for butt fusion and electrofusion. If he's been properly trained, he'll show you both his butt fusion and his electrofusion card. We wanna see both. So here we have a saddle go through the animations, Dan. Here we have a saddle on the OD of a main. You see those two little plugs there. Go to the next slide, please. And we plug it in just like we're charging our battery. Um, and the cool thing about these couplers, as well as saddles, is they have copper wires in them. And we heat those copper wires up. And it heats the ID of the saddle and the OD of the pipe simultaneously. And it uses these hot and cold zones to achieve what we call a proper melt. Next slide. And those that cold zones act as a dam and that dam holds that resin in there. So if you ever see resin coming out of a coupler, you'll know that it wasn't snug enough and that's not a good fusion. So the next slide shows the coupler machine on the lower right-hand corner hooked up to that coupler. We're fusing a, um, a um, flange onto the end of that polyethylene pipe, getting it ready to connect to legacy material or say a, um, a valve or some other connection. So that's electrofusion. Uh, I love electrofusion. It's how I think you should connect your main to your services or your laterals. Uh, we have classes just on that. So polyethylene is impact resistant. I'm not gonna guarantee you that it's gonna stand up to the teeth of that bucket, but I am going to suggest to you that um, it will stand up to the bucket, but not the teeth. And we're, we are avoiding these kind of failures. There are two humans on the right of this 1985 copper mine in Colorado image where there was a mass wasting event. That's a 12 inch polyethylene line with at least two butt fusions in the middle of it. Imagine how that stretched as those thousands of tons of earth went into that river during that mass wasting event and it did not fail. Dan likes to say this BMW driver didn't get the memo. So the contractor getting ready for a pipe burst just picked up that pipe and let the guy drive right underneath. And the image on the right is very common in pipe bursting and horizontal directional direction drilling operations where we see 45 degree angles, sometimes 90 degree angles on the polyethylene pipe. The other thing that doesn't get talked about too much with polyethylene is go ahead, run that video, Dan, is the fact that it's a one-man operation fusing up 250-foot sticks of polyethylene. Uh, this is six-inch polyethylene DR11 blue stripe. Um, this was furnished by Corin Maine uh, at the Austin, Minnesota job site. And this guy's going through the clean it, shave it, heat it, fuse it process. He pulled that stick of pipe off and put it in the fusion machine and on the pipe stands by himself. Now he's checking his high and low after he faced the pipe or shaved it. Now he's checking to make sure that that heater plate is in the 400 to 450 um, temperature range. And you're thinking, oh my God, this sounds so complicated. Once you're trained, two hours of doing this, you're done. It's fantastic. But back to the guy, one guy doing fusion operations 
while his buddies are digging, this is an open cut installation in Minnesota, while his buddies are digging the trench and preparing the connections. And there we have the beautiful thing known as fusion. Danny Landy, go ahead. I was just curious, how come when I take the easy job, everyone gets on me, but when he does it, you make this guy seem like a hero. Dan, that's because you haven't done enough fusions <laughs> outdoors. But yeah, he is a hero. That guy, that's what he does for a living. And interestingly, Dan, in Austin, Minnesota, those guys used to be fixing the failing ductile water mains and cast water mains. Now they're doing the installations because they've gotten their um, their water main break numbers down below 20 per year. Fantastic story. I love telling it. And believe it or not, you can squeeze this stuff off. Um, here in the lower right-hand shot, we have this footage squeeze tool where this guy looks to me to be about a 10 or 12 inch polyethylene line. And Dan, what are the rules for squeezing down and then releasing the polyethylene pipe? Oh, well, I know I just got corrected on this last week. I want to say it is two, I'm sorry, four minutes per inch on the way up, two minutes per inch on the way down. So you can go, you can go twice as fast on the way down. It takes a little bit longer on the way back up to let that pipe relax. And uh, they say that you can squeeze off at the same point an indefinite amount of times. Uh, I'm not sure why you would do that if you have the option not to, but uh, it is in fact able to, to happen. I know the piece of pipe that we take on the road with us, we use the same piece every show and we haven't yeah. had any problems with it. Uh, the reason is gas companies squeeze off as a normal part of their operation, Dan, um, and their rule is don't squeeze in the same spot because if you don't follow the rules, you could, you could in fact damage the pipe. So they, they go um, two diameters away, typically, from the previous squeeze, and they sign it. Hey, Doug Keller, can you come on? Um, I noticed here that the Plastics Pipe Institute has a technical note, number 54, that specifically addresses squeeze-off. But what role, Doug, does the Plastics Pipe Institute play in this whole matrix of organizations in the polyethylene industry? So the Plastics Pipe Institute is a bit broader than the Alliance for PE Pipe, which just focuses on water and wastewater applications. Um, PPI also focuses on gas, oil and gas gathering, um, corrugated and conduit applications as well. And what PPI does is develop these technical bulletins, technical research papers um, that address uh, key concerns of um, the industry. So in this case, in TN54, we're looking at how do you properly squeeze off um, you know, pipe for a water, oil, and gas applications. So we develop a lot of these technical notes and technical reports. Some of them go on to become ASTM uh, standards or practices. Yeah, you also have uh, the engineer there is Camille Rubiez, professional engineer, very talented guy, Doug. You guys are lucky to have him. Um, and I see today in social media that you just released another technical note on cold weather operations. Yeah, yeah, they're coming... We seem to re release one every week or so. Yeah, so it's, it's we're very that's, prolific. Yeah, ASTM F twenty six twenty is the standard related to butt fusion, and the great thing about this new release from Camille and his municipal advisory board, Doug, is it gives even further direction on cold weather operations, which seem to be more of a thing these days because more and more utilities are using polyethylene in cold environments. Yeah, Richard, uh, go. Uh, Thank you, Doug. Yeah, oh, and I, I want to mention Richard before you go. Uh, Doug is the current chair of the Plastics Pipe Institute. Uh, we're lucky to have you today, Doug. Richard, go ahead. Um, yeah. Hey, Doug. Uh, hey, the squeeze-off tool, do you know the maximum size they're at today with the hydraulic ones? Yeah, I'm going to guess 32 inches. Um, I know it's over 24. I'm thinking 32. Okay, thank you. Uh, Doug, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, 16 inch is the typical size right now for a hydraulic squeeze off tool. Their um, 24 inch was available. Um, the issue is that they start to be very difficult to handle and to get into the trench because of the hydraulics. Uh, okay, thank you for the clarification. All right, moving on here. I, I noticed we still have um, all but five people and we're at 60 minutes on this call, you guys. I want, I'm very proud of you and I wanna thank you for staying with us. We have, um, I don't know, probably 15 slides left, uh, and we will absolutely be done by 15 minutes after the hour. Hey, uh, Dan, before we uh, talk about dimension ratio, could you mind throwing up the poll question? We can leave it open for a couple slides. Um, we have one final poll question, and we also have a survey at the end that's optional. 
uh, and Dan will bring up this poll question. So it's, what is your current polyethylene pipe usage? Just pick one. All right, so dimension ratio, uh, we'll leave this up for a minute. Dimension ratio is basically the OD divided by the minimum wall thickness gives us our DR. So for the purposes of this call today, DR11 is the practice dimension ratio for water in the United States. Everybody uses DR11. And DR11 is a 200 PSI working pressure pipe that takes occasional surges to 400 PSI. That's a very stout pipe. Most cities run in the range of 60 to 100 PSI. Therefore, a DR11 can handle that working pressure plus surge very easily. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, there was a question earlier on today about um, the DR and the pressure rating compared to uh, PVC pipe at 360. And the gentleman was uh, saying that he had to move up to a DR7. Uh, that's really not true. Uh, what I would like you to do is um, there's a pace calculator on the plastics pipe website that you can compare the steel to the PVC and to the polyethylene, uh, looking at service life of greater than 100 years. Um, the one thing that you need to understand because of the viscoelastic or ductile behavior of polyethylene, um, we have pressure um, multipliers in when surge events occur, as, as Peter just mentioned, whereas the rigid products have reducers. So it's not really a direct comparison and it's not the way to, pressure class is not the way to compare pipes uh, from legacy to high density uh, products. It's just not the way to do it because- yeah, It's just a different way of thinking, Richard. And that's, you know, kind is. of repeat it. Go ahead, Dan, to the next slide. So uh, one of the things that Richard, Richard's company who works for, he's the technical expert at WL Plastics. Um, uh, he um, has very, been very prolific, Richard, and we're very thankful that you spent time with us on these calls. Uh, but we're now looking at the fourth generation resin. Um, and we have those little black things in there. That's the black master batch that gives polyethylene. It's indefinite outdoor life under pressure. So it's not like PVC. We're not going to degrade over time. Now that gray pipe, I showed you on that one video that will degrade in the presence of sun after 36 months. But prior to then, it's okay. But black pipe, no problem. And we, over time, have kept making this product better, better, and better. We've solved for our original first and second generation failure mechanisms. Now we're in fourth generation. We're still making it better and better. Hey, Dan, let's go to the next slide and let's take a look at the results of this poll. What is your current polyethylene usage? Used it a few times, and we got a quarter of the people are regular polyethylene users, and 23% are fairly new. So, and 50% have used it a few times. You're in the sweet spot. Um, you, let us help you with your next project. The C factor, just like with PVC, is 150 for the life of the pipe. PVC doesn't support bacterial growth, neither does polyethylene, unlike the metal pipes. Next slide, please. So 150 is the C factor for the life of the pipe with polyethylene. We make IPS sizes, and we make DIPS sizes. DIPSs are marginally larger than IPS. The reason we make DIPS is so that we can match up with ductile iron pipe size. And we are pushing DIPS for municipal water throughout the United States. The reason you may find IPS more available sometimes is because IPS is used in all those other markets that I mentioned. Next slide, please. You also can get co-extruded pipe um, stripes on there so that when somebody unearths it, you can see what's flowing in that pipe. Uh, next week, I'm going to have some data on current pricing in the 24-inch DR11 size. Uh, no, not pricing, current availability, 24-inch uh, and also 8-inch so that we can share that with you on availability because I know some people reached out to me today. The reason they're paying attention is because they can't get other pipe. Um, so what, is, what do other products look like over time? Eh, not so great. We've already looked at that. Next slide. What does polyethylene look like over time? Richard, give us your view of how polyethylene ages from the inside out. Yeah, um, well, it, it, it really doesn't um, because nothing really... Uh, impacts polyethylene, especially water systems, even with uh, oxidizers present. Uh, in this particular case, this was supplied by Lionel Bissell. This picture is actually about 10, 10 years old. So this line is still going, it has an electrofusion that's 10 years old, uh, 41 years old. And what you're seeing is just a rust buildup. 
uh, some kind of high iron content in there, but you can see the nail scratch there. It just it easily comes off. So it doesn't support any growth and nothing adheres to it. So um, the pigging aspect, if you had greases and things that have built up over time in a gravity system, yeah, you could pig it out, but it's really nothing's gonna, nothing's going to affect the performance of that pipe. And your flow rate stays the same for that whole time. Richard, you mentioned earlier that we saw some failures in Arizona. Could you give us a 60 second review? Because I know some of our listeners are concerned because our, our, our competitors like to say, oh yeah, the product fails in the presence of chlorine. Could you give us 60 seconds on that, please? Uh, first of all, not anymore. Uh, that uh, that uh, mechanism is gone, but chlorine is, is an oxidizer. It's an oxidizer to any material. Uh, first and foremost. So when we had the, the polyethylene tubes in Nevada and uh, Las Vegas area uh, coming up the sides of these houses because they don't have basements, uh, the west side and south facing tubes that were exposed were very, very warm. They got up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit, which made chlorine very, very active. Uh, so it affected that slow crack growth performance of the polyethylene. And it was a real learning tool for us because it was the second generation polyethylenes that was, was being used at that time. And they, they failed. They had little pinhole failures, which is classic slow crack growth uh, uh, type failures. So we looked at that. We, um, uh, the MAB, the Municipal Advisory Board, did an extensive study on it. We surveyed over 423 municipalities. Uh, did all kinds of things, regenerated the, the resin, uh, reinvented the resin to eliminate that problem. And that's exactly what we did. And today we have a new self-classification for um, chlorine resistance, which is in the ASTM D3350. So yes. we understand that mechanism. Yeah, and the exciting thing about it is for those that have, have 30 year old pipe in the ground, Richard, the conditions that caused those failures were over the prescribed EPA limit on residual chlorine, greater than 80 degrees heat and high pressure. So there were some pretty unique conditions, conditions. that caused that yeah. failure. Yeah. All right, Dan, thank you, Sorry. Richard. So Dan yeah. was able to find the video that I asked him to find. Um, so Dan, run that video. And this is how we use an MJ to connect to an existing PVC system. It could be ductile or cast just as well. So this is about a 60 second video and we're digging it out and we're going to jackhammer the concrete away because what we see here is a restrained uh, joint for PVC that had to be restrained with concrete. So we've got to get through that concrete. And this is fairly typical. So we obviously we've shut the water off in the neighborhood. We're removing that T. We are creating a new T with new PVC and a ductile iron T. And we're dropping it in mechanically with a mechanical connection, as you would with any other system. And now we're preparing the polyethylene that's going to be the T on that PVC mainline. And that's what Richard talked about as an MJ adapter, mechanical joint adapter. Um, and we put the male end and the female end of the valve Connect it up just like we do any other way. Now this is fully restrained. We do not need to pour concrete on the polyethylene part of this. And this spool piece is just about ready to go. And we have our own valve on the other end that's gonna connect up to the pipe burst polyethylene that we're pipe bursting that afternoon. So obviously you got to measure twice and cut once, but you can see there are two butt fusions there on that mechanical joint adapter. The mechanical joint adapter comes as a kit. It includes that gasket. It includes the male end of the MJ adapters that fits into the ductile iron uh, T, and then you just bolt it up. So that's our video of what how you connect up with legacy materials to the polyethylene. Really pretty exciting. All right, we got a few slides left and we're gonna finish up in two minutes. Thank you, Dan, for showing that. Um, all right, so next slide, please. It's all right, DR9. 
So here we have, you know, we, we talked about a failure a little bit. You know, we're not afraid to talk about it. The best data that we have, and I'm hearing a little audio there, Dan. One additional. The, the best data we have comes from the United Kingdom. Next slide, please. So on the far right-hand side, we see the averages and polyethylene failed. This is pre-4710. So this is first, second, and third generation polyethylene failing at four times per 100 kilometers per year, where ductile, PVC, and cast iron are all failing at a much higher rate. Um, I want to make one final plug here for the specifications. We're going to talk about standards tomorrow, Dan. Let's just go to the next slide. Um, we have, um, next slide, go to specifications, please. There we go. Uh, Dan talked about the specifications in our engineer's package. This is something you have to ask for that we provide to you free of charge. Uh, Doug Keller talked about the Plastics Pipe Institute work. We've taken a lot of their work. We've added some of our own, and we've created a package for you guys to use to establish your library. And that's what this is. So you just send me an email or Dan Landy an email. Next slide, please. Or go to questions. Yeah, that's it, Dan. Thank you. Say, hey, send me the engineer's package. Send me a PDH too for today. We'll send it all to you over the next week. Dan, could you run the survey so we can get everybody out of here on time? And let's ask for some uh, comments on how we did today, what we can do better. And I'm really very interested in what other topics you want to see us address in calendar 2022. Uh, while you're filling out the survey, I want to say thank you to Doug Keller from the Plastics Pipe Institute and Lion Del Bissell. Thank you, Doug Keller. Great job as always. Thank you, Richard Colossa from WL Plastics, an engineer. Great job, and we'll see you again shortly. Um, so uh, where's that survey, or does the survey only show up when we're done? Once we sign off, it'll come up. So if everyone could answer those two questions, we'd appreciate it here, hearing from uh, what you want to hear in our upcoming series. Good. All right. So we're going to sign off. We'll see a lot of you tomorrow because I know you signed up for tomorrow. Once again, audience, thank you so much for hitting our first um, show of the PE Roadshow Light program, also known as Webinar So Well and So Strong. And thanks for staying to the end. We'll see you next time. Good. See you guys. Thanks, everybody.